Okay, what I'd like to try to accomplish in the last uh, hour that we have before we break for dinner is I think Chris would really like more information about what we would like her to do with, with the model she's developed. Um, we, we talked about uh, getting data for uh, exposure in, in young children and, and that will be provided to her. Uh, data relevant to exposures in pregnant women. Um, what other issues would members of the CHAP like her to explore? I think we kind of agreed that the, the um, uh, points of departure and, and the reference doses that are in those two scenarios is sufficient. We don't at this point need to use other values. What else would we like her to do? Besides the data that you showed for children's teethers and stuff like that, yeah. is there any other data you've collected on things like um, children's um, shampoos and things of that sort? Yeah, we didn't look at uh, cosmetics. Okay. They're not in our jurisdiction, but. Okay. Um, and they're, well, they, they weren't covered, and they aren't covered by the rule. Um, but we did uh, look at uh, child care articles. I'm trying to think, what does this include? Things like uh, cups. Uh, I, 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 I need to bring up the list. Well, but. whatever you select, a few, not a laundry list, and um, add it to the ones that you have you're going to be giving us the data for already. And I think that can be used effectively to help give the, you might say, the ground truth to some of the values that we see in urine data. Okay. Okay? And I think Holger and I also, and just to let everybody know, we, we ended our debate pretty quickly. We decided we were going to ignore all the human data and just go with the model data. Because there's uncertainties also in all the biological data. And the moment you start looking to define uncertainties in greater and greater detail in one set of data, you gotta do it in the other. And I think we'll just lost, we'll get, we'll do exactly what Phil didn't want us to do. Get lost in the weeds. Because the uncertainties will just overlap. So we're gonna, we're gonna leave it just with the model data. sort of playing on that, do we want Chris to do things like uh, what if 75% of the exposure is dietary? If so, what specific what ifs would we like her to, to explore? So, and so that percent, those percentages, like somebody needs to give me reasonable values for which chemicals and which, what percentages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to we need to get some specifics here, so we can uh, make assignments either to to Mike and, and his staff or to members of the panel that will actually come up with information that we need. So if we since we can calculate at least estimates of daily intake in micrograms per kilogram per day units, since Mike can give us values at least for some of these toys at least on average or whatever kind of distribution. Then if we also on the other end have percentage of some of the chemicals that, are, that we think at least on average might come from food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're kind of <coughs> wiggling our way down to figure out are those values, are they going to overlap or are they sort of telling the same story? I mean, so it's somewhat. It brings us closer to closure on it. And I think that was what I was trying to achieve, and I think that's what Bernard wanted us to achieve this morning, so that we knew we were in the same ballpark for both the, down up, down, from bottom up, and up down. So that that works because then we can have up, so we can have scenarios for how many times a child drank out of a cup per day, and what the uh, the migration rate is based upon things of that that sort. And you can have it over a course of the year. 
those kinds of items will help you determine how much of the urinary component for different chemicals, and I think we have to select three or four or five, I think that was one of the things that was being suggested, to see where we sit on the scale so that at least we know, you know, still probably 90% or 80% diet. But I think let the data from the exposure scenarios drive that final decision. And I think that would be reasonable. But I think we have to select the, the agents we want to look at. And I, I defer to toxicologists to give me a little bit of guidance on which ones you think are the, the lowest hanging fruit or the most important hanging fruit. If we can put that off just temporarily, that's one of the things I'd like to get back to. But in terms of uh, helping Chris with, with a list, uh, Chris, in terms of um, where the exposures are coming from and how much is coming from different exposures, um, maybe we can just leave that as uh, uh, something we would like you to do. When you start thinking about this, when you go back home, uh, you're probably going to come up with questions on how am I going to do this and what information you'll need. Then you could get back to, to Mike and, and or members of the committee and, and get help with that. Well, also me, I mean, I think me and Holger will be able to help you out in terms of, once Mike gives you some data, we can then help you back to how to use that data appropriately to make a scenario. So you know, we'll, I'll be involved with that. And, and perhaps maybe we should get into uh, what, what Paul was talking about in terms of what agents are we going to be focusing on. Because one of the things I think we might like you to do is uh, what other antiandrogens might we want to look at using your scenario. Um, and maybe different combinations of phthalates and other antiandrogens based on some logic that I'm not aware of. but. Um, that sort of thing. So I think maybe we need to talk uh, right now about what phthalates, what phthalate substitutes, and, and what other antiandrogens are we are we interested in plugging into this hazard index analysis. Yeah, the requirement would be that there'd have to be um, metabolites or, or exposure levels in um, or concentration levels in children and in Hanes. So I mean, as long as as long as that was the case, they could be added. Or whether there were other databases that had that information. I mean, I don't really know, Russ, what other... Are you saying in Haines because that's where you think they would be found, or you would want it to come from the same database as the phthalates? Um, I think it's difficult to get raw data from people who feel like they have ownership of their data, even if it's nationally funded. Um, I mean, I know we're going to request data from people, whether or not they'd let us actually use it in the way we want to. So I know I can get to NHANES in a timely way. I don't know that I can actually get into somebody else's data. I hope so. I don't, I don't want to be a naysayer, but um, it's more difficult and there's potential that people won't agree to it. So I, we know we have access to NHANES is the reason I'm saying. What about the stuff from Columbia? I mean, it's going to be hard to get. Well, we, we, we haven't yeah. asked yet. I mean, um, Columbia I don't know, would be a think so. fairly Robin relevant. Robin Wyatt and Pereira. Yeah. Pardon me? For Robin Wyatt and yeah, Ricky Pereira. I would think that Robin yeah. would want to. Um, yeah, if it's released anonymously just with maybe the, the phthalate levels and a few covariates. Mm -hmm. So maybe you might mm -hmm. want to ask them because yeah. they've got a really good database. About six, seven hundred pregnant women, I yeah. think. And now, does Mary Wolf also have a set of data? Yes, yeah. So I think from Mount Sinai, Mary Wolf might be another person to Bruce inquire. Bruce Lamphere, who's Bruce, um, yes, who's was in it Vancouver. East Cincinnati, but it's at Vancouver now. So he has phthalates in his data set. So those are three good. Th this is related to pregnant women, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So but let's get back to the the list of phthalates and antiandrogens. Are there any out there that either there is we know of compelling databases where we could extract the information and use it or some other reason why we should look to see if what mm -hmm. there are data if we look at the data from individuals I think there is no better data set than in Haynes sure 
And I don't think that uh, with the pregnant women and uh, newborns, we have any other data than delayed data. Do we have, did they analyze any antiandrogens or any other chemicals, maybe except BPA? I, I don't think Pest, that. Some of the pesticides, the non some of the pesticides, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So we have to be aware that as soon as we leave the secure and Haynes track, we are getting on tricky surface or let's say not so robust or. But, but that shouldn't preclude us from venturing out into the forest and see what we can find. If we can trap some good data, well then we should use it. Yeah. The question then becomes how do we do that? How do we step out into the forest or into the forest <laughs> to see what's there? Is that something? Well, and to ask if we can use it, um, you know, can we publish it? Mm -hmm. Can we, what are the parameters around some, using yeah. somebody else's data? Um, Mike, do you have criteria that you can, a letter to or a discussion yeah. with an investigator saying we'd like this data and this is what we'd like to use it for? And I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. I mean, I don't have any uh, specific uh, you know, process, but we'll um, ask, we'll explain, you know, what the data are for, how they will be used. You know exactly what uh, information we need. Now, if I remember under the Shelby Act, anything that's funded with federal dollars has been published in the scientific literature, they have to hand over. Hmm. Good. Period. If they don't. They have this, I think they do. If it's been published in a scientific article, not if it's something that's in draft, but it's actually been signed and it's being used in a process for discussion of a federal regulation and they decide they want to be a participant, then the raw data can be ours. I remember because that, that's what happened with the Harvard, the whole Harvard scenario in the, in the, in the late 1990s and that's what ended up requiring the Shelby, Shelby Act because it's all federal dollars, it's tax dollars. So, you know, I, I think they'll be more than happy to participate, but this is kind of important for us to have more data than we have now. But going back to Phil's question about other anti-androgens in, in enhance, I mean, I'm trying to remember what else is there. I don't think they measure vinclozolin or uh, I don't recall. Uh, if, if the panel is all right, I might volunteer myself to join forces with Chris and to look at uh, these other antiandrogens. I think there might be a few polybrominate flame retardants and compounds like this, but right, Russ, there's not. Well, we have to go through the, the NHANES database. I would suggest that's the mm -hmm. first port of call and then see whether there are other databases that are informative in that respect. Perhaps something might come up at the uh, meeting that's going to occur early next week at the EPA. Mm -hmm. Learn of more information. Now, what is, do you know what the real agenda is? Because I'm going to the first for the first day of that meeting. I, I haven't seen an agenda yet. Neither have I. I was just wondering if you had an insight. Uh, no, but they're, I'm, I'm supposed to talk with them before the meeting, but like the day before, I think so, All right. or or next week sometime before prior to the meeting. Um, so I'll see what they uh, if they well, have anything. And I, I'm actually pre presenting on the second day. Oh, okay. So, so we'll at least will be covered both days. But I'm I'm curious as if if you can have reasonable discussions with EPA if there's some way of them perusing their databases to see if there's anything to help augment what we're doing. You should broach that subject when you're. Well, I will, but I figured since Mike's going to talk to him first. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what you're thinking in terms of pesticides or? Yeah. Okay. Pesticides, primarily. That might be a big can of worms or something. Oh, sure. Pardon me? Uh, in terms of what? The concentrations in urine and all that material? 
Yeah, there are there are a lot of data on pest. In fact, if you look at it, because of the passage of the Food Quality Protection Act in the nineteen nineties, the EPA has done an incredibly good job in terms of characterizing multi week exposure and the partitioning of the urine levels of the various pesticides based upon food, dust, and other things. So they have a wealth of information in that regard. It's a matter of what portion of it would be useful for us that we should be thinking about. But they've done a very good job. I mean, is it proprietary? No, they, these are all published. Oh, okay. They have, in fact, they published a gigantic summer report, I think, a couple of okay. years ago. Okay, well, we'll definitely. I think Linda Sheldon is, is the lead. She's, okay. she's their lead person in neural who headed the pesticide um, research program down there. Yeah. Be a valuable resource at least to find out. If they've got data that'll be useful to us. So, but are we limiting ourselves to anti-androgen chemicals? That with the reference doses that are published, um, that are measured, where the metabolites are measured in NHANES. That, I mean, unless we go to another data set, but the data set that, that we have now. We can certainly explore NHANES, but I think Paul is saying that there may be some database information at EPA as well on, on pesticides. I, as far as I can see, there are no pesticide metabolites or urinary level, levels or blood levels in NHANES. But what, what we need is information about exposure to pesticides from mm -hmm. any other source, and what Paul said with EPA may, may indeed be very helpful. I just want to point out the complexity of the task, like with vinclosolin. Vinclosolin is uh, metabolized to an aromatic amine, and aromatic amines are not measured in enhance. And it's broken down to an aromatic amine that can be a metabolite of other substances too, so it's, it's, yeah. But that, but that we can put in the text yeah. as to why we're not going to consider it. Right. I so what we need to do is to find out what is available exactly. for what pesticides, and we'll use the data we can, mm -hmm. and for what we can't, we will say why we can't. And if there's something in there that's really important for the future, we can say that in any reconsideration in the future that people should be, should be beginning to plan on how to fill these data gaps. For example, measuring the, the amine. Right. Uh, that's a recommendation we can make. So are we, are we saying this as a way of correcting for any, uh, any approach that we use for the data that we've got? Or because the, the requirement for the data, for the approach that we're, that we're talking about is the same levels, you know, one urine value, all these values coming out of it. If we, if we go to, to EPA data, I mean, we could say there are additional risks due to blah, 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 but it's, unless it's, Before we, before we go any further down that road, can I make uh, another plea for perhaps going through the charge and then, so I think at this stage we really need an impression what the good work Chris and Holger has, have done really helps us in addressing that. Yeah, that's what I to get to. So. Um, but I do think that we do have to consider before we leave tomorrow what are the, the agents hone in on, because yeah, there's a uh, laundry list that we had the first meeting that took my breath away. And I think, I think all of you were clear in saying that we have to focus more, more specifically on the ones that we think are critical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Mike has, has put up the, uh, the relevant information, and so I'd like to go uh, to point number one under, on the second half of that slide. So we are to complete an examination of the full range of phthalates that are used in products for children, including, one, all the potential health effects, including endocrine disrupting effects of the full range of, of phthalates. So to my mind, most of that is going to be done in writing. 
and, and Mike's, I think, already put together some information that summarizes all the potential health effects. Um, we're going to ultimately focus on you know, male reproductive effects, and we'll give our rationale for why we're going to do that. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're, we can handle point number one fairly, fairly easily. Any, any comments? And number two, consider the potential health effects of each of these phthalates, both in isolation and in combination with other phthalates. And I think that's the beauty of what you have done that allows us to do that in spades. I mean, you know, make any kind of combinations we want. Um, but that, I think, does come to the point of what are the phthalates that we're going to, to consider and, and other substitutes, um, other anti-androgens, so. And I, re uh, uh, mm, I require a little point of uh, clarification here. All of the potential health effects, uh, we need to be clear what this means or how this should be read. Mm. There's one, I mean, when I first read this, I thought <laughs> potential health effects, there's an emphasis on hazard assessment. The text in the law is not very clear about this. They say scope of the risk assessment without, but if we apply the, the uh, terminology or the framework in the red or unread book and now the silver book, uh, we have to distinguish between exposure assessment, hazard assessment and risk assessment. Now in, I'd like, uh, us to be clear about this point number one is this um, does this for example require an aggregation of information about exposures with information about hazards to come to any risk characterization risk assessment in my mind actually it doesn't because it says all of the potential health effects the emphasis on potential so I think we are required to look at uh, the range of adverse effects that are likely to arise from exposure to phthalates, but independent of, of specific exposure levels. Or am I reading this wrong? I mean, that's how I would interpret that. So we would, we would do essentially a laundry list. I agree. To me, that's a selection based upon hazard and how we then parse partition it depends upon the exposures and other issues. For clarity, the, the wording in the statute doesn't say scope of the risk assessment. It's, it, it describes it as a, uh, an examination. The CHAPS examination is supposed to cover all these things. So that right. this is my summary. So you can cross out risk assessment and put in examination. Point two is where we then go from our laundry list down to male reproductive developmental effects are, are what we're going to use as our endpoints in the hazard index assessment. Does everybody agree with that, I assume? We talked about that in, in the uh, conference call. So then getting to, to point three, examine the likely levels of children's, pregnant women's, and others' exposures to phthalates based on a reasonable estimation of normal and foreseeable use and abuse of such products. That one, I, what does that mean? Um, I think the same thing that the laundry list means for the hazards. We have to define them, draw a list, and then we focus on what we feel the most important, which we base somewhat on the data we'll be getting, as examples of what we have to consider, noting that the background will be dominated by diet. I think we have to lay that out very specifically, that the dietary issue is a confounder, and that what we're going to try to do is lay out the scenarios that are most important in terms of children exposures based upon the relevance of the, that background for each one of those chemicals we select. But, but 
essentially that point is that's exposure assessment. Yeah. Exposure assessment. Yeah. Point number three. Couldn't it also come from the work that we do for estimating daily intake? I imagine showing the distribution of the daily intake for each of the chemicals. Yeah, of course, that's part of it. That's just totally part of it. Bio, the biomarker, biomarkers are not divorced from exposure assessment. They are a component of it. And you're, what you're doing is basically probably the most firm, firmly based science that we have in this whole process. So clearly that is a significant contributor to that, to number three. Just to be clear, so this, the second part of number three is referring to use of such products, mm -hmm. right? So really making conclusions based on mm -hmm. toys and children's articles or, yeah. Things of that sort. Well, yeah, I mean, I assume that means products for children. Well, it's also well, up, up on pregnant the women, so it's, yeah. it's meaning cosmetics, I would think. So. Oh, okay, okay. I had to do it by hand. Because yeah, well, it, exactly. A, a com completed examination of the full range of phthalates used in products for children. I would think we want to limit it to children. Yeah. Since it's, you don't that, have regulations over cosmetics. Well, That's we don't have, FDA. yeah, right. I mean, we don't have uh, authority over cosmetics right. or food. But food will be used as a baseline, the yeah. background. Yeah. Because children and pregnant women eat all these foods. So, but when we're talking about the actual children's products, I think we're talking about plastic toys, we're talking about um, plastic utensils, things that they use daily or periodically. And, and, and uh, presumably or uh, things in our jurisdiction. Right, well of course. Yeah. And then you have to lay that out for us too. Yeah. But that, then that doesn't make sense because examine the likely levels Pregnant women's exposure to phthalates in toys? They're not going to be exposed through toys. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot. In fact, almost nothing. I mean, that makes th that makes that. It's an incongruous statement. Yes. Absolutely, it's totally incongruous. There should be a there should be two to totally separate statements. One about children and toys mm -hmm. and products, and then there should be one about women pregnant women or pregnant women of, of childbearing age and their products. That, th that's an incongruous statement right there. Plus the abuse of such products. So we have closed the circle, so it's all products. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, we're, and again, I, I think we're, we're gonna talk about this in a laundry list way and uh, then what data we have with pregnant women that might inform us, we'll use, but that's all we'll have. Yeah. I mean, if can we, is it possible to separate statement three into one that relates to kids and one relates to, to, to pregnant women or women of child, childbearing age so that it's not an incongruous statement? I, I, I think it's, when it, it's within the CHAP's purview to make that distinction. Let's do it. Do we want to try to simulate a, a scenario that could be representative of exposure levels or at least concentration, well, estimates for daily intake for children less than six years old? So if we're going to, am I making, so if we, if we, <coughs> so we've got NHANES, we may be able to get other data, but we have NHANES that goes from six to 18. We can, we can use Mike women. is going to give you data that would be from zero to 36 months. Correct, Mike? Well, we're going to try to get biomonitoring. We're going to ask for biomonitoring data from the study authors. What I'm going to, okay. what I have is, is data that c could be used to estimate those exposures. From I mean, toys. From toys and yes. children's things. But 
But I, I think I'm just trying to say that, you know, if we don't get data, yeah. at least in a timely fashion or whatever, I mean, I'm just. You're going to have to use, you have to use whatever you have from NHANE as your baseline. And based upon exposure scenarios that can be constructed for the kind of products that can be used from zero to six, again, you'll get a, a fairly good idea of what the intake would be from so those products. So therefore, even if it's for six to 18, do not, do not necessarily think that it's gonna be, there's gonna be an overwhelming disconnect there. Unless you find it in the products that they have for children, very young children, the numbers come up real high. And you'll say that the NHANES data are not applicable, but the, the levels here are much higher than we find in NHANES from six to 18. So therefore, it is an issue. The worst that it can be is at least a rough point at which to assess the exposure or intake that we're going to estimate for very young children. So my question is, do we want to try to simulate it based on, I mean, Holger and I did a, a, a simple case where we just said DEHP is 50% higher. Do we want to try to improve on that with additional chemicals, toys, that have different kinds of, other than, D, I mean, I don't even know if DEHP is the right chemical that these toys are made from, but um, can we make that simulation a little bit more based on real assumptions? Also, I'm not sure what assumption you make, so maybe you can give me a little bit of clarity there so I can say yes, no, or maybe. I, I think the the most important approach is to get the, the urinary data for these children. So that will kick out most of the assumption part right. and then we'll have to modify the calculation formula. Okay. So the more the better. Yeah. Okay. We could also down extrapolate from the enhanced data, but I would prefer to base the calculations on, on actual data from these studies. Mm -hmm. I think four kind of answers some of the discussion we were having relative to three because it says consider the cumulative effect of total exposure to phthalates both from children's products and from other sources such as personal care. So I think if we break out mm -hmm. the two groups that, that kind of takes care of that. Yeah. Um, you mean the pregnant or child or childbearing women versus the children will have a natural segue to personal care products yes. for them? And that. Right. All right. Um, five, review all relevant data, including the most recent, best available peer reviewed scientific studies of these phthalates and phthalate alternatives that employ objective data collection practices or employ other objective methods. And we will. <laughs> yes. Just take a deep, deep breath, right? Uh, six, consider the health effects of phthalates not only from ingestion, but also as a result of dermal, hand to mouth or other exposure, and I think to the extent that we can do that, we're, we've already <coughs> talked about that a lot today. Well, I, don't, I don't see where this is anything different than one. Uh, anything different than number one? Number one, well, why would we expect the health effects to be modified based upon whether you get the material by dermal hand to mouth or inhalation, unless it's cytotoxic? Along those lines, or um, I'm, not, I'm just not sure the, what the, that means there. The, they, well, it probably means that uh, for some chemicals, the toxic effects you can expect depend on route of exposure or route of administration. And I think we are asked here to consider that, whether that matters. And if we find it doesn't matter, we just say so. It, because I think we're focusing on male reproductive, right? Yes. Focus. Would you anticipate this to be driven by route of entry into the body by the deposition. There are issues <laughs> concerning allergies and um, allergies and um, let's say, what do you say? Is that our primary focus right no, now? No, it isn't. 
it isn't, so I think we can. Well, I, I think it could also, number six could also mean that <coughs> when we do the scenarios, don't just do mouthing, but include oh, okay. so dermal we'll contact and so on. Sorry, if we can. I, th I think that's what they meant, but I don't know. Well, that's the way we interpret this. And all the biomonitoring data do that. They yeah. take into account By all the sources and routes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and seven, consider the level at which there is a reasonable certainty of no harm to children, pregnant women, or other susceptible individuals and their offspring. And is that, is that something that can be readily done with your hazard index assessment approach? Again, the, the, this is, uh, uh, six and seven are again typical hazard assessment subjects. Well, they go, they determine the, uh, which is it, the denominator of, of the hazard quotient. But you don't need any exposure information to address these points. Right. Yep. And, uh, I mean, I think a level of no harm is something like a reference dose, which you calculated, right. and I think that's what they're right. getting at. The reference dose and then the amount of risk is based upon the amount of exposure. For someone who doesn't do this sort of thing, so how do, how do we accomplish that? We, we take information from the literature and make statements about whether there's no harm at a certain level, is that what you're saying? Those values have been published. I mean, the Andreas has published the one set. We have other estimates of them from Earl Gray, mm -hmm. right? So those are our cases, right? Yeah, yeah. That that needs to be critically examined to the best scientific standard. Yeah. Well, is 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 uh, any of the EPA RFDs associated with that too? I, I think the EPA ones are out of date. That's what the meeting next week is about. Right. Uh, updating those. But I think, you so know. Would you they have some relevance to seven? I, I, I think the. I'm the, just asking. I'm, I'm wondering I think how, the published how far levels. Apart we are. I'm, I'm just yeah. inquiring. I, I, I think the published levels are old and they're updating them. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, you have reference doses. Um, you can calculate your own if you want to. It's up to you. You can call them TDIs or something else if you want to. There are some uh, of these data in the Irish, da uh, Iris database, sorry, slip of the tongue right. there. Nothing to do with Ireland, Iris. Uh, but uh, the criticism of the NRC panel was that a lot of these data are not suitable for um, examining, um, say, effects uh, related to anti-androgenicity, et cetera, et cetera. So that needs to be looked at, or that's EPA's job, but we have to go back to the literature. But No, because I, I was looking at this also. Is, so is, is this... Um, this the review, latest, this the, the 17, review of the 17, yeah. so is that part of seven? It's part, part of the defining, having to the criteria well, for establishing seven? Well, that's a review of the toxicity data that could contribute to seven. To, to start to come yeah. up with a number for seven. Yeah, All right. but I do, we don't necessarily have to come up with an, I don't think we necess, don't necessarily have to come up with a number for all 17 or all 29 or whatever. Okay. In fact, for, for some of those, the data are from sparse to practically non-existent. Well, will that be part of our selection process for? Yeah, I, 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 
uses the chemicals that well, the, should be on, focused on? We did, I mean, the, the, the staff came up with a list of phthalates and prioritized them. And those 17 are the, the bottom two tiers. Perhaps one of the assignments that we should take back to the room tonight is to look through this document so that tomorrow we can go through and say, okay, this is what's out there. Which of these are we going to put into your assessment? Well, uh, I mean, Chris and Holger can only in, in terms of their assessment, are limited to what's measured in engines. That's true, that's true. Now, yeah. for the other, the ground up, uh, that the limitation isn't there, but um, on the other hand, if uh, you need to know what products they're in. And, and, yeah. um, I, I don't think those are high priority ones. I think it's a question of toxicity, usage, and exposure. So if we take, for example, dipental phthalate, it's one of the strongest phthalates, but even industry is not using it. So um, we might have to talk about it in terms of toxicity, but exposure-wise, it's not an issue. So actually, one of the strongest phthalates is not hit by the ban. But it, we would say that. Yeah. Okay, then the final one is consider possible similar health effects of phthalate alternatives used in children's toys and child care articles. Not sure why other products fall out here, but. Because well, not used in the same way. I, I get. Well, I think it's because the because the or the ban the uh, the prohibition applies to uh, toys and child care articles, and these are the substitutes. Because you know, one of the questions, obviously, if you take out the phthalates, what do you put in in their place? And this is simply to uh, see whether these. Um, to look at the substitutes, and they're saying, in particular, similar health effects. Um, and, and for our purposes, that means anti-androgenicity. But then that says that if these are anti-androgens that are drugs or pesticides, but they're not used in children's toys and child care articles, then we don't need to include them. We wouldn't reach out to those groups to reach to find other anti-androgens, mm -hmm. well, unless they're phthalates or phthalate substitutes. Yeah, well, I, I, I think eight is specifically to what's going into the toys to replace the phthalates that were removed. I mean, the other an, um, anti-androgens that have, we've discussed um, is a separate Other comments, Mike? Do you else um, want to accomplish? Uh, I think we've we accomplished a lot today, um, and I I guess I would just uh, uh, you know on the top on the subject of the other antiandrogens, it's not you know our focus is the phthalates and the substitutes, and certainly it. We can't ignore that or shouldn't ignore it, those other things, but they're not our primary pur purpose.
Jesus. Well, that's what we said. All right, so um, hearing no further discussion, we'll adjourn for today and reconvene tomorrow at 8 a.m. Thank you all. Thank you.